Many times when there is a natural disaster, we are able to tune into the major news networks and follow what is happening and watch real-time footage of the devastation and relief efforts from the safety and comforts of our homes. When Hurricane Maria devastated the island of Puerto Rico one year ago in September 2017, I immediately saw friends begin to organize and plan ways to help. Social media became a forum for planning and raising money and supplies to assist those in need on the island. Some donated to established relief agencies to help with broader efforts, while others gathered supplies and planned personal trips to bring aid directly to their loved ones in their communities. In this video, we will hear from one of those unsung heroes who left the safety and comforts of his home here in Massachusetts to assist his friends and loved ones in Puerto Rico. Miguel Prieto is a retired educator and former youth pastor. He's affectionately known as Mr. P by those who know him, and he's a dedicated husband, father, and a great friend to many in the community. He does not have any formal training in disaster relief or emergency response. He's simply a man of action who felt compelled to help when he saw that there was a need. Here is his story. Today I'm here with my good friend and mentor, Miguel Prieto, who we affectionately refer to as Mr. P. We're discussing events that took place exactly one year ago when Hurricane Maria made landfall and devastated the island of Puerto Rico. Thank you for being here, Mr. P, and thank you for sharing your story. I'm so happy to be here with you, Brian, so shoot. <laughs> Before the storm hit, did you and your family on the island have a sense of what was coming? And at what point did you realize how bad it was going to be? Well, I wasn't in Puerto Rico when it happened. Elizabeth was my wife. Elizabeth, she was in Puerto Rico, and she was there for the, for the first storm, Irma which did some some damage to Puerto Rico but not as much but that gave her a pretty good idea of how bad it was going to be because Irma didn't didn't make landfall it basically like skirted the island on the northern part of the island but we knew that Maria was going to hit directly to the island so seeing the damage that Irma did to the island at the, the first time and this and Maria was coming two weeks after we pretty much had an idea that this was not going to be a, a, a good situation that that Puerto Rico was going to go through something that it has never gone before do you know what kind of preparations your friends and loved ones may have had prior to the storm arriving the regular preparation that we are used to in Puerto Rico to to do before a hurricane I mean we have been hit we, we're, we're hit by hurricanes almost every year, but never, never directly, usually skirting on the side, like tropical winds and whatnot. So we, we you know, we put the wood in the, in the windows, we get the water, we prepare with, with the batteries. We know that we're going to lose some power, but it's, it's the power will usually comes back like two weeks, maybe one week or two weeks after the fact. Mm -hmm. So the regular normal preparation that we, that we're used to and accustomed to have after uh, before uh, a hurricane happens. Describe the experience that you and Mrs. P had when you were trying to contact your family there after the, the storm hit. Okay, when Maria came and it knocked out all the power in Puerto Rico and all the cells, there was no communication whatsoever, which that never happened before. And usually you had some kind of communication to the island but this was uh, like total. There was no way to find out how things were going in Puerto Rico. And uh, when Maria hit, by that time, Elisa was already here home. She was with me, but my family was in Puerto Rico. Everybody, my brothers, my, my, my nephews, my, my Elizabeth's mom and Elizabeth's brothers. I mean, the whole family was there. And we were concerned because, uh, Again, we never had a total total blackout, a total lack of communication. So we were like trying through either cell, a computer, Facebook, any kind of communication means to see we could get contact with family. That's the if there is a I, if I want to mention the most horrible part of being in the United States while this hurricane happened. 
I think that the most horrible part was not being able to communicate with your family, not being able to know if they are okay, I mean, right. if anything happened. So you're sort of left alone with your your worst fears. And and, and that's it day. because there's no you can't call anybody. You can't even. And then little by little, communication started through uh, streaming in the computer. Uh, Wapa TV, Wapa TV in Puerto Rico found a way to stream live the news that was going on in Puerto Rico, not in the studio, but through some kind of streaming system that was able to reach the United States. And we were able to finally see what was happening in the island. And it, and it was no good. It was uh, like, when we saw the images, when we saw the devastation, we don't we can't remember seeing anything like that it was complete it was total we're talking about not only uh houses there are wooden houses but we're talking about houses made of concrete mm -hmm. that were just devastated destroyed i mean like houses that imploded because of the winds and whatnot flying debris hitting cars hitting people People having no place to run, people that they, they, not even staying in place was was enough. The the waters coming into the house, that the waters rising ten feet, fifteen feet in areas that we never never saw any kind of flooding. Um, when the images started going into the countryside, and then we saw that streets were gone. Mountains were were like melting. Hmm. Uh, you could see the, the 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 sides of mountains coming all the way down, and covering or destroying streets, and we we were like, you you would think that it was an earthquake that was going on in Puerto Rico, but the thing is that the power of a of a Category Five hurricane hitting an island like the way that it did, and it was like a lawnmower running from the beginning to the end of the island. There was no place in the island that was not touched. Every single area, which has also never happened before, every single town, every single city, everywhere was touched by, by this. And it was touched with total devastation. Um, so the fact that, that, it, that, that there was no place to go, and there was no no area of the island that was not touched, created a, a, a crisis of its own because then you didn't you couldn't find uh, help within the island like immediate help within the island, and uh, so people didn't have any kind of direction of what to do. I mean, where to go? What what am I supposed to do now? And because of the lack of communication, the lack of, of TV, and, or lack of, uh, at the beginning, the first three, four days were very chaotic in Puerto Rico. It's incredible how, how a, a, a town, a people, Puerto Ricans, were able to, in the middle of something like that, to, to unite and to be able to put their resources, their own resources together and to be able to start helping each other. To start checking homes, making sure that everybody was okay, getting people out of their homes, getting people uh, out of their the the, the elderly shelters, elderly uh, homes, uh, hospitals. They were checking everywhere, making sure that people were okay, and bringing them to P. And they assumed that the best places to go would be to schools, to. Uh, to churches and and, and and they and people assume correctly because when people started to go to, to schools and to churches there were people there waiting for them to provide some kind of assistance after that after the hurricane uh, happened but uh, the first four days of the hurricane was un unreal and the fact that we were not able to get communication here in the United States and know what the heck was going on that was the worst experience you could possibly go through. At what point did you decide that you physically needed to go there to help? 
okay, when we when 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 at last there was communication and we were able to know what the island needed, the the island the 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 the, the communities here in the United States mobilized very quickly. And you had pockets of areas like New York, New Jersey. Uh, you had areas in Florida where Puerto Ricans and all kinds of people, not only Puerto Ricans, but everybody, were bringing food, they were bringing water, they were putting, bringing things to the, to, the, to the area so that we could send uh, food and we could send uh, the necessary items that the island would need to the island as soon as possible. But then what happened? For whatever reason, once the items were sent, and big and big, uh, how do you call those big things where the, oh, the, the containers, the shipping containers, the shipping containers and whatnot, they would stop them at the at the docks, and then a, and then bureaucracy, uh, it got in the way. Red tape, the items were not uh, allowed to enter the the I the item until they were uh, checked. The people that were coming with trucks to disseminate the items to the island because they didn't have the required licenses or whatnot. They were not giving these items and distributing them to the people they were. There was so much red tape in the middle of a, of a disaster like this that was going on in, in the island. But I said, no, forget that. I am sending nothing mm. through this way. And, and I want to make sure that my stuff, if, if, if I take something there, I want to make sure that it gets, it gets to, to, pe to the people. So I thought the only way I can do do that is by by going taking it myself, going myself. Can you talk about the challenges that you face trying to make your travel arrangements to get there? Okay, the one of the the, the thing was cost. Uh, I I was able to fill two luggages, no three three big luggages, with um with filters with uh with solar lamps. Not as much because I really didn't know exactly what was the need in the island, but I I knew that they were going they were going to need um, medical supplies, and we I had a lady in my church that got me antibiotics. They got me a, a lot of material for for clinics in Puerto Rico that I was able to put in the in the in my suitcases, and uh, and I asked by coincidence I asked. People like like Brian. People like, look, I'm going to Puerto Rico. You guys can hook me up with you know a little a little something something. I really I thought that I was going to maybe raise four hundred dollars or something like that. You know, and people were so generous, and they gave. Uh, I mean, they gave me that for my first trip. I went with about two thousand dollars in 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 with of, of cash. That I was able to disseminate in cash to the people that needed that, plus the items that I that I that I that was able to take. The JetBlue was super helpful because I was able to to take these items through JetBlue and they didn't charge me anything for the suitcases. So um, these suitcases would have cost me maybe fifty buck fifty bucks each if per you know to be able to transport it in the to the into the island the JetBlue didn't charge me anything so I was able to go take the luggage with me take the monies with me when I got to the island I, I hook up with a church that assisted me in going to different places and whatnot but then I realized that this first time that I I brought a lot of stuff that it was an immediate need and very little of the stuff that they needed the most. For example, I didn't realize that they needed uh, filters mm. as much. That was the one thing that they were asking the most. They needed filters. And I, oh, I wouldn't, it wouldn't dawn on me. An island that is completely surrounded, surrounded by rivers, that is completely surrounded by, by water. You know, there's fresh water everywhere in the island. And that wasn't the case anymore. The island was completely surrounded by rivers that were polluted, that was contaminated by the soil and by the the discharge of of of, 
of industry because they had to discharge the, the chemicals uh, because of the hurricane and because they didn't want to... Well, it was a mess. And, and so the waters in Puerto Rico was affected unbelievably. And, and then diseases that never... that were eradicated in the island 60 years ago, 70 years ago, all of a sudden they, they were starting to come back again. Yeah. It's like... Uh, this diphtheria, uh, your 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 Giardia, diarrhea, diarrhea, leptospirosis, yeah, stuff like that that you you wouldn't even hear about like for years, and then all of a sudden it was happening left and right. So I stayed in Puerto Rico the first time for two weeks. The transporting of the items to places in, within the countryside was almost impossible. Because the, the, there was no streets. It, it was like the mountains were, were covering the, 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 the debris. Everything was, in, places were impassable. So the, the second time that I went to Puerto Rico, which also JetBlue provided me with assistance, this time I went with the, so my suitcases were full of just filters and, and, and solar lamps. And that was, I took, I, I, can't, I can't even remember, maybe about a hundred filters, about 200 solar lamps. It was, I mean, my baggage were, were my packages were packed. And I, and I, and I also went with $4,000 that my church, Congregación Leon de Juda, plus uh, Melissa School, uh, the McCormack uh, Middle School uh, in Boston. They raised about a thousand dollars there. So I went with enough money to be able to, to buy food in the, in the island. Uh, so when, when I finally got to Puerto Rico, I, I, a, a pastor received me uh, at, the, at the airport. They got all this, the items. I rented a big, a big uh, a van to be able to transport items to the island. And we were able to, take, to get trucks. And we were able to get, we had about three trucks. We, we, were like, we were like fully prepared to go to the countryside and to put those, car, those trucks on top of debris and to go through the mountainside. And we were able to, to make it to the areas that, were, that, were, that, had, that had the need. We bought uh, enough food for 150 families uh, for seven days. And we were able to make it to those places. Can you talk about what areas you visited uh, okay. during your, your trips there and, and what kind of work that you did there? Okay, we, we drove directly to the Caripe ba Barrio that is close to the area where Calle is in Guayama. These are in the center of the island. This is real, this is pure countryside, beautiful countryside. But when we were, when we were driving there, the, the trees were so denuded of leaves that it was uh, like a Dantescian uh, site. You, there was no, no trees with leaves. It was, it, you could see areas that people never saw before because it was covered by, by lush trees and forests and, 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 and mountains covered with trees and with with so much foliage and whatnot, all of that was gone. You, the, you, you could see everything, and everything. It's, it looked like a, like a, like a, a giant bear, with the hair standing up. It's the only way that I can describe it, and it was really sad to see your an, an island that was so beautiful because of the lushness of the, of the scenery totally devoid of, 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 of flo flowers and, and, and flora and, and, uh, and trees and whatnot. And then all of that in the, in the, in the, right in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. So you have to either go over it or you just have to move it up from the side. We, in some areas, we had to put the ropes around the, 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 the the lumber and move it and push it with the trucks to the side so we were able to so in essence while we were driving towards the area that we were going 
we were really clearing the the place for the people that were coming behind us and and the people that live in the area they were very grateful when they saw us doing stuff like that they thought that we were part of the government that were providing <laughs> the help that they they were thought you were an for. official relief agency right, <laughs> that we were an official relief agency and i was like no no, no. We're, we're, we're just, just regular guys we're just regular guys <laughs> getting the stuff out of the way and people were like clapping and they were like so happy to see us doing <laughs> that and whatnot. and a lot of them came down to with machetes and to to provide us with the help that with some more help that we we needed but once we removed the big stuff they were able to chop their way into the small stuff and they were able to uh to, to clear the rest. So, so we, we really cleared a lot of road before we got to the area where we were going. So when we got to, to El Barrio Carite, where we were heading, and this barrio where we were going was, is, um, it's in the, it's in the, inside the, the state forest called Guabate in Puerto Rico. So, it's a state forest because this Puerto Rico wants to protect these areas because of the beauty and the lushness and the importance that these areas have for the ecology of the island. Well, there was no ecology anymore, at least when we got there, because everything was so denuded, like I explained before, that uh, there was no there was no forest as we can as we can describe. Mm -hmm. it, it was something else. So we got, we finally got there and there were some people that were waiting for us uh, uh, there at the, as we were going, we were also stopping and leaving uh, food and whatnot to people that we saw on the side. We were leaving some monies to families. Also, we had some cash that we were also leaving, but mostly the food that we had and, uh, and the solar lamps and, uh, and the filters. Uh, when we finally got to the area where we needed to go, I didn't realize that this was okay. We were at the we went up to the mountain, and this was a road that was going down, all the way to the plot where these farmers had like a, a cooperative farming area, where it was subdivided among about maybe twenty families, mm -hmm. and they themselves did their own their own harvesting of different foods and whatnot like. Platanos and plantings, uh, oranges, uh, different spices and whatnot, uh, uh, bananas. Uh, it, it was a, a lot of different, but I didn't. We didn't see it at first because the road was completely um, covered by debris and by you couldn't see the street. Period. There was there was we were standing on it. And we were like thinking that we were on on the forest. On, on I remember the, when you showed me the pictures when you came back. I remember thinking you were in the middle of like a jungle somewhere right. with devastation everywhere, and there was no, no sign of a road. No, and this was supposed that, that once upon a time there was a road there, and so and our job was to clear this as best as we could, so that people could make it to their to their plots. And when we saw, and I personally, because I'm not a, I'm not a, a handyman, and I'm not like I don't do hard labor. I was there. Uh, I went there, and I'm like, okay, I'm volunteering to assist these people. I got, I got all these items and bloody bloody bloody, and we and we were able to disseminate those. We bought we bought chainsaws, and we bought uh, and, and getting the gas for the chainsaws. Uh, uh, I, they, they asked me for that and I really didn't realize what it was at first but now when we got there it was like well, hello they, 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 it, it was we're talking about huge trees huge limbs of trees like in the middle of the road and we wanted and and the, and, the, and the plan was to make it all the way to almost a mile of, of road to open a, a space enough so that, that these people can were able to go to their plots and i'm like thinking this is at, at first we were like i ho i ho <laughs> i up to work we go and we were like doing and moving the stuff and bloody blah, blah, blah and cleaning but as time went by it was nine o'clock ten o'clock eleven o'clock and the sun was hitting 
And the thing is that the sun was hitting because there was no coverage of trees. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was like the sun and you hitting you while, all of, while you were doing all of this. And, and, and we couldn't just see the end of it. I, I just thought, we're not going to finish this. We're not going to be able to clear all of this. Uh, you're going to be able to see it in the videos that we, there, were, there were times where we were like, give, we were about to give up. Yeah. We were not going to finish this. So around five o'clock, we stopped and we look at what we did, which was, was a lot. And what we still needed to do, which was also a lot. And we were like, I don't know. I, I think that we're not. Uh, but then we just said, look, let's just stop. Let's just rest. Let's just see how we feel. And let's just decide that we're going to do yeah. this. And we just decided that we're going to do this. You caught and your second wind and, and you kept going. We caught the second wind and we just kept going. And we, and, we, and we finally opened the road all the way to the... I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, it was, a, it was a group effort. It was a lot of people that were working there. There were uh, uh, university professors, university students. There were also farmers themselves that were also working at the thing. It, it was unbelievable. The, the, but it, what, what was really cool to see was people that were professionals, all people that were not... That's not what they do for a yeah. living. People that are professors, they're in the classroom teaching right. at the university, and they were there, and they were they were genuinely getting getting at those trees with machetes and what. And you have women and and, and, and and men into this thing all the way until. So there was no way out. I, I was I was not gonna be the one that's going to stop no. it. No, no, no. I, I mean, just, what, some of the things that you're describing, you know. I know that when uh, that we we talked before when you first came back from your trips and what I'm hearing now is like a very collective effort by everybody, and that was one of the questions that I had. You know, in, in a disaster scenario, it's, you know, sometimes people can think about their own family and their own needs and kind of focus solely on that. But it sounds like you know your experience and the experiences that a lot of other people that I know that went to to Puerto Rico shortly after Maria described to me was this very collective communal effort with people helping each other and helping their neighbors and coming together. This uh, Maria did something to Puerto Rico that it's not that I, w I, 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 I thank God for Maria, but in a way Maria transformed the character of Puerto Rico, or at least it brought to the surface the true character of the Puerto Rican. And, uh, you know this the 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 island didn't wait mm. for for help to arrive the island did everything the most of the stuff that was done in puerto rico was done by puerto ricans and not professional not people from excuse me not people from fema not people from the government i didn't see in everything in all the effort that we were that we were doing and we were doing like serious effort. I didn't see no governmental presence right. anywhere, at least in the areas where we were. I'm not saying that the government didn't participate. They didn't. They did. I know that they did. But when we, when we were doing all of this, there was no governmental presence of any kind anywhere. And there were people there in need. I mean, there were people that were stuck and trapped on there and there. And we had to get all these uh, this debris out of the way and and provide them with the, the assistance that and, and this was done by poor, I, I mean i felt so gratified to see people that never they never i mean i never seen these people before mm -hmm. and i left and when i left they were like family to me yeah I mean, we were working together and we were like laughing and crying and getting angry and complaining and <laughs> doing all of this stuff and and when we left we we left with memories and and i still email and contact some of these people that i met at at that time that i've never seen before it's incredible it's incredible so the the areas that you visited you know were very rural areas it sounded like and there was a lot of devastation um, I know that you have a lot of experience with hiking and backpacking and that sort of thing. So rugged terrain is not anything that's new to you. No. 
Uh, and I know that right before you went, I remember you, you had gotten yourself into pretty good hiking shape. Um, do you feel like any of that helped you uh, during your time there? Uh, well, the, the one thing that, it, that, that, that helped is that there were people that were... <clears throat> there were people when they saw what needed to be done and the steepness, the steepness of, the, of the road as it was going down that they, they were afraid of, of doing that, of, mm -hmm. go, of going. And so, but I, I, I saw the, 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 I just thought of the Blue Hills. Right. And so I was, uh, that, and we can do, this is something that we can do. I mean, but these are people that never hiked mm -hmm. in their life before. They have gone through, down this road numerous times all their life, but this thing became something else. This thing became a rugged terrain that was that was being uh, walked upon for the first time. Yeah. With all that debris and all those rocks and all that sand and all that mud and all that stuff. So, but I felt that I, I number one when I saw it, I knew I could do it. Right. And when they saw a, a, a fifty-nine year old man saying that he could do it, but a lot of the younger ones say, "Wait, hold it!" But then. Then we can do this too. I mean, if he if he say it's doable, then it's doable. So I know that the one thing that my hiking experience helped me was to bring assurance to the people that were coming with me that this is something that can be done. That right. we can that we can traverse this. That we can that we could if we're careful, we are we're gonna be able to to do this. Uh, but not, but I know that without my hiking experience, if I have seen that, I would say. Man, I'm sorry, but this is, you can't, we can't do this. This is not, yeah. this is not, this is un, un, unpassable. Just getting to the, to the lumber, into the trees, it was, because it, it, there was so much, you didn't know what was under the stuff. So you were walking, but you, sometimes you would go, whoom, and your legs would go into a hole of, of what nothingness like we don't know what the heck what was there and uh and even the people that that were from that area they didn't recognize the area right. so they were they were looking at the at the they, they were the ones guiding us and telling us where to which way to go as we were doing the thing but they're looking at it like it's the and first we're looking time at this and like oh my god we can't pass it so they really needed time to get there to get their bearings because they wanted to make sure that we were going the right, the right direction, yeah. the right way, because it, it it didn't look like anything that they remember before. It was complete, yeah. a completely different terrain to what they were used to. So all the landmarks were gone. The all the landmarks were gone. The, yeah. tre the trees were gone. The, the the point of references were gone. Everything was on the road. So there was nothing. There was no left, right. Yeah, it was just go down there and figure as a matter of fact when we ended do, when we finished doing the whole thing everybody realized that they had we finished a different role hmm. that in, in some areas we deviated a little to the left or a little to the right some area we really deviated to the okay there was so much debris that we just couldn't get the stuff out of the way so we had to go a little to the side and what so in essence the road that we open now is the road that they're using now <laughs> yeah so it's a new road it's a, so it's a new <laughs> road and they just left some of that debris there until the government is able to go there with tractors and yeah. with, with the big machinery and really are able to so the road that we created for months i mean i i would have to go back there and see if they were able to clear, finally turn it into a real road right. and i'm assuming that that i don't know how much priority the government would have given to this particular area but if it was it was done they did it with machinery like the big tractors the big uh, yeah stuff you didn't have available yeah, something we didn't have available then can you talk about the challenges of being there to provide assistance while trying to be self-sufficient and minimizing your impact on the resources? So it's like you're there, but you're, 
you're a consumer at the same time while you're trying to help. So well, the thing is that I we made sure I made sure that I when I, everywhere that we went, I I went with my stuff, with my own food, with my own. But the the, the Puerto Ricans are, are are so generous, even when they don't have mm. when they don't have stuff. They will make stuff out of out of nothing, and the families that were that were on on, on top of the mountain that were where we where we started doing the work. They 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 prepare meals for us. Hmm. They 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 kill. They, they had the chickens that they were finally able to find. They they made soup out of that, and they were able to, and they prepare sandwiches. And with some of the food that we that we brought, naturally we were able to open some of the cans of spam and some of the stuff. And so, we didn't use. We tried as much, but again, again, Puerto Ricans are too generous. They will not allow us to leave the place without them offering us coffee or something for us to to eat. But we had our, our, our own water. We had our own food. We had the, the gas, the gas that we needed to 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 propel the the chainsaws. Mm -hmm. We got the chainsaws. Everything that was used to be able to do the work that needs to be done, we brought it. If I lived in an area that was facing a hurricane, and I didn't have any guarantees that anybody was going to come and assist me afterwards or bring me supplies, what would the supplies be that I would need? to be able to keep my family alive and, and well. You would need at least a month, a month, that's, and that's a lot of money, a month supply of portable water. You have to have portable water because the water, not even the water is going to, it's coming from the faucet, it's going to be drinkable. So as soon as the, the hurricane hits, you'll see brown gunk coming out of the water faucet. So that's, that water you can only use for the toilet and for and for flushing the toilet and, and basically that's it. So you need to have a potable potable water like as I don't know a month worth of, of bottles of bottled water or a water filter. And a lot of people, Puerto Ricans right now are, are putting water filters in their mm -hmm. houses to make sure that the water that they drink is is, is potable. Um, the, the other items are basically food like rice to have enough, enough, the, these items are items that you don't want, you don't want to eat under normal circumstances. You don't want to eat every day, but in a situation like in a hurricane, hurricane where you don't need, where you can find, uh, you're not going readily, to the grocery store. You have to get protein. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you have protein. That you got, uh, so, and you got, and, and you know that you're not anything perishable is not gonna do because you you can't talk about vegetables, you can't talk about meat, you can't talk about uh, you can't talk about fish uh, unless it's canned. Right. So because it, the refrigerator is not gonna be good, you're not gonna be able to put anything to. So it has to be a lot of canned foods, a lot of you know, rice, uh, beans, uh, again cans. And enough of that for for the family for at least a month, for at least a m one month, because under normal under normal circumstances, uh, Puerto Rico has never never before has gone more than three weeks maybe after a hurricane mm -hmm. without the power coming back and everything else. Maria was uh, an aber a complete aberration. I mean, we still right now after a year, and people are are, are denying that. But there, are, I I know that there are pockets in Gua Calle in Guayama that they still don't have uh, electricity, and they still don't have any power, and they still don't have portable water, and whatnot. So, it's it's it's. This is something that has never happened before in the island, and particularly uh, uh, Puerto Rico is not a third world country; it's a first world country. That became a third world country, and Puerto Ricans learn to survive in a third world environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I'm talking about an extreme third world, third world, third world environment. That people that had their roofs, they had homes, and they had all of a sudden living under carps, under tarps, and and so 
you know, that's that's, that's the best advice that, that we, we were able to. Because people that's don't really have enough money. Yeah, yeah, they don't have enough money to be able to buy more food. Yeah. You know, but people are stocking up even now. They're stocking up. They got, you got families that have six months worth of, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has become an island of survivalists. They have, they have learned their lesson very well. I was going to say a lot of times out of a crisis, you know, you find that people learn oh, some, some tough lessons, but if, if Maria taught anything, it was definitely that you cannot rely on that power oh, coming right please. back on and, and then you cannot, the supplies that's the, being that available. The one thing that Puerto Ricans were used to is to rely on the government. Mm -hmm. If something happened, the government would take care of it. And they don't have to worry about nothing because the government... So people were very lax yeah. about... about. Well, like what, you said before, there was never the magnitude. No. The, the entire island was devastated. It wasn't just you know one city or yeah. one region or one corner. You know, you had the whole island experiencing the same yeah. trauma, the same devastation. So now you got, you're going to find yourself, uh, it's going to be very rare that you're going to go to a home in Puerto Rico that they don't have a, a, a side of the house that have stacks and stacks and stacks of water, stacks and stacks of canned foods and whatnot. All of that there, just in case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know... I, I think it's, that's a very good thing. It's a good thing. I'm yeah. very happy that you're doing this. And that's really cool. Yeah, You keep doing that. You don't... Uh, and they have developed a very healthy distrust of the government. Mm -hmm. I think a very healthy in the sense that it, they have become more self-reliant. Right. Uh, they have learned a lesson. I mean, they got their butt kicked. It was really, really hard. But once they started realizing how things were, and once time went by, and and people think, hold it, this is the, this is a, a American territory. This is the United States. We are not supposed to be in this situation six months after a, a disaster. Mm -hmm. That this is not possible. And not the most powerful country in the world. This is not. This is not supposed to happen. But then people got their eyes open and they, they realized, wow, okay, so this is how it's going to be. All right, so now we understand. Now we understand and, and we say, okay, things, what it is, what it is. Now we're going to take care of things ourselves. And now we're going, I'm going to be able to take care of my family by, my, by ourselves. And now we're going to make sure that we have enough water and we have enough food and we have enough of batteries. And we know, if, you know, what we need, right. we're going to have. I think a lot of people in the, the emergency preparedness community have that philosophy of, you know, if, if there's a relief agency and all those things that can help, that's awesome. But you can't rely on that. You have to, you have to be responsible for your own family and your family's needs. And, you know, the way I look at it, it's sort of like, you know, we, we pay for car insurance, hoping we never get into a car accident. Right. This is like, you know, in another form of insurance where you have food and water and the, and the water filters and all those things to make sure that if something bad happens, that you have a way of providing for your family in that time. Yeah, but this is like, this is the only community, total community, like the whole island mm -hmm. that is made out of people that are extremely aware of being prepared. Because, and not because they learn it by reading or by uh, checking out things or by going to a course and figuring out, mm -hmm. no. This is by going through a hard experience. Real life experience. Real life experience. Suffering, understanding what it is because you're living it, what it is like to not have water, what it is like not, not to have food, seeing your children without with that they're waking up and there's nothing to provide for them when when in a family that was used to uh being able to provide provide everything that now puerto ricans are in a in, a, in, a, in an attitude that not again not in not anymore uh -uh. this that's not going to happen so i'm telling you i i if i'm going to find people that know how to prepare themselves you gotta go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> you go to Puerto Rico, man. They will give you. It's an their, island of preppers. Of preppers, yeah. It's like they, 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 they 
They'll show you. Yeah. And and then you go family by family. Look, this is what we got. This is going to hold it for six months. This is where we're going to go. This is what we're doing. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, they know north, south, east, and west. They know where the, 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 the centers are. They know where to call. They Everybody has a crank radio now. Everybody has a way to communicate. They know what's not going to be available. So they, they are prepared for that. And, 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 and that's important. I mean, so that's a, that was a very important lesson. It's a very sad lesson. And, I, and we're still reeling with the fact that it shouldn't have happened the way it happened. Not the hurricane. But the after the the response, mm -hmm. it, no, that was the disappointing thing. The hurricane, that's nature. I mean, you can't stop that. But the response, the the lack of it, mm -hmm. the lack and the disorganization, and the and the, I mean, we're talking about come on, the it, uh, FEMA, FEMA, the United States is not a. They're not uh, like uh, newbies in, in, about in these things. They know. They know what's up. I mean, what happened? You people keep asking that question, Puerto Rico. What happened? Why it happened this way? Why we didn't get the resources and the su support and the help from the government that we needed? You know something? It's okay. We didn't get it, and we learned to do it on our own. And I think that at the end, that's the best way. Of, that that's the best way of doing it. Mister, is there any anything else that you think would be helpful for uh, the audience to, to know about? Um, the only thing that I can say is that there are certain things that are that going through a through a disaster is not a natural. It's not something natural for people to go through. We don't live at least in the United States, and in western countries we don't co coexist with disaster we don't live with disasters every day so we don't know how to respond to it in the one thing that i see that happens when a disaster happens and i saw it now in the when florence hit north carolina and south carolina when harvey hit and uh, texas last year when the diff different the one thing that is equal in every situation is how people come together. How people, it's, the, it's, a, like, it's like a human nature to, that to provide help in the midst of a disaster. That you, it's not about you anymore, but it's about the community. And I think that that's, uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's something that is biological. I think that there's something in us that that becomes com communal in the middle of a disaster that only will will only show up or will only appear in the middle of a disaster but it's an imperative it's something that that is in you that kicks in when a, when a disaster happens even if you're far away from the disaster even if you're not you you're not a victim of the disaster if that disaster disaster touches your family or it touches a place that you care about you're going to feel that pull to do something uh, for that for that for that for that situation and to provide assistance and whatnot so i think that if this is a god-given thing then god was very smart i think god is the is an unbelievable prepper he he knew he knew what to give to give us so that we are able to survive situations like this. It's built into us, the survival, in. the survival instinct. Yeah, it's built in. Not, not just the survival, the myself surviving. Mm -hmm. it's, us. Me, it's us. The us, us surviving. surviving. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I saw that in, in Puerto Rico everywhere. And I didn't see anybody. Even homeless people were helping people mm -hmm. getting out of the waters and whatnot. I mean, everybody gets just kicked in. It just, it just happened, and everybody was helping everybody. It's unbelievable, and then I think that is just very natural. It's something that we have that we can do, and that's a very good thing. I feel so happy to be here. 
to help my people, my Puerto Rican people to be able to, you know, rise up again and, and to make sure that they are able to do what they are able to do. Amen.